Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Breen Bible Church, Grace Life Church. Again, we're located in Evansville, Indiana. For those of you who've been sending gifts, we appreciate it. And this is my phone number if you have any questions and or comments. If you want to know more about us, our website is gracelifeunleashed.com. YouTube is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. Facebook is Grace Life Church and or Breen Bible Church. And, and again, if you're on Facebook or the website, the videos are all on YouTube and on Rumble. And if you get on YouTube, please subscribe. And you know how that's played. On Wednesdays, we have a podcast called Grace Life Unleashed Podcast with Pastor Dave playing chess in a, a checkers world. And um, I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start to see a few things start to unravel a little bit. So be prepared. I, I do think we may uh, be going through some rough times ahead of time. I, I had a guy that called me this week and he's like, so who named you the uh, economic guru of the grace movement? And I went, well... Uh, no one. He goes, well, just so you know, I think you're right. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but he was trying to be cute. Um, what we're going to talk about today is along the same lines of a few things we have been talking about. And for those of you who are wanting me to move on, just give me another week and we will. But um, this gentleman asked me a question. He goes, so what did Paul know and when did he know it? And what he was talking about was, I've said before, I don't think Paul on the road to Damascus understood the grace message that day, or even in the next three days. He understood something, but it wasn't that. So he says, all right, so when did Paul learn grace, is what he's asking me. And he said, can you give me all of the references to show where you're coming from? And I went, well, by the time I do that, let me write a sermon. <laughs> so, uh, so this week I was working on a sermon, and there is a paper that goes with it. Like everything else, it needs to be edited and, and finished and stuff. So I'm working on just helping people understand the book of Acts more than anything else. One of the things I want you to understand, and this is the... Denny uses this more than I do as far as when he teaches, but this, this, this is so good. And, and there's a whole flyer you can get that has this that folds out. But if you look on here, and I know you can't probably see it on television, even in the room here, this says diminishing. And if you notice, this line is not straight up and down. Okay? And what it's trying to say is that the kingdom program was diminishing. And I think the kingdom program was starting to be set aside in the sense in Acts chapter 7, anybody remember what happened in Acts 7? Stoning. Stephen. Stoning Stephen, because Christ stood up and he was going to judge Israel. And if he would have judged Israel, the tribulation would have started. And I was asking a guy years ago, I said, so what did Christ do? Obviously, the tribulation didn't start. He goes, well, he sat back down. <laughs> like, okay. And I know that's a little bit figurative, but in a sense, the judgment never happened. But there was a judgment. Israel was temporarily set aside. But there's diminishing from Acts 7 all the way till Acts 28 in the sense, and this is where I, not all, every pastor agrees with me, you could still be saved into the kingdom program up until Acts 28. But the signs were fading away. The power was fading away. The, the Holy Spirit, in a sense, was pulling back. And we see that, you know, the... The unity we saw in the beginning of Acts when the Holy Spirit came upon everybody and they had all things in common and they all got along. Remember that? You know, Isn't that cool? Everybody gets along? I had a guy tell me once, if you take all the grace believers, I don't care, in a single city, <laughs> make it simple, and put them all together in a room, how long before we'd have chaos? <laughs> it's, <we're, laughs> It would never happen, right? <laughs> no, we'd have chaos very quickly. So, but the Holy Spirit came upon these folks, being of Acts, and they all had all things in common, and they all got along. And that's the Holy Spirit's work. But we start seeing very quickly in Acts when the Holy Spirit starts pulling away that we have chaos. But, and this is, this, I think this is important. You could still be saved into the kingdom program. And, and one of the criticisms I had, and I mentioned this last week, Pastor Stam believed that everybody who was alive in Acts 9, who was a kingdom saint, was moved into the body of Christ. That's the 12 in doctrine, okay? I don't see that. I think that caused a lot of problem with some of the things that Stam wrote after that. I love Stam. I love the things he wrote. He did a lot of good work on getting away from denominationalism, and I appreciate that. But that's one thing he did have wrong. But another thing that I disagree with a lot of theologians on is I don't think that grace ramped up. People are like, oh no, no, Paul had a he had a 
learning process. And they say one of the, the key things we know is that Paul didn't understand that water baptism was out until later on in Acts. And that's why in Corinthians he's like, yeah, I, I water baptized some of these guys, but I don't remember how many because God didn't really send me to water baptize. That Paul had to be told that by God. I don't think that the grace program was ramping up. I think the grace program was totally on board 100%, not in Acts 7. But, and you, some of you are going to be um, interested today. I do believe Paul was saved into the body of Christ in Acts 9, but not on the road to Damascus. We're going to get to that. <laughs> You're like, well, what do you mean? There's a lot going on in, in Acts chapter 9, more than people realize. And so we're going to look at that today. But this diminishing, I think, is very important. And one of the key things is you look at all of these, these supernatural sign gifts of tongues and healing and prophecy. There was a time when Paul could send somebody a handkerchief and they could be healed. Okay, But by the time you get to the end of Acts, what's he telling Timothy? You know, Find that handkerchief. No, what's he saying? Drink a little what? Wine. Why? For his stomach's sake. Why didn't Paul just heal him? Because that gift was gone. But yet we also see towards the end of Acts where Paul was bitten. Bitten? Bit? Is it bitten or bit? <laughs> By a poisonous snake. And they're all standing around. Bit? Nancy, I should ask you. Forget it. Is it bit or bitten? bitten. He was bitten. Bitten. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> either way, a poisonous snake bitten him. <laughs> see, now it sounds wrong. <laughs> it bit him. And they're always watching him. What are they waiting for? Waiting for him to die, okay, and he doesn't die. Now, was that just the fact that Paul had immunity, or was that a miracle? miracle. I believe that was a miracle. So Paul still had a few of those nice, cool things. And that's one of the, the neat things about, if, if you read the Bible, that's normal for kingdom saints. In fact, someone told me this, and I found it interesting. During the tribulation, there's these ugly, fierce serpents that are stinging people. And that's one of the reasons that the kingdom saints have this ability to handle poison is because when these poisonous things bite them in the tribulation, they won't be having the same effects as the unsaved people. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds kind of cool. But either way, they can drink poison and it doesn't bother them, and they can get bitten by snakes. But I do not recommend you do that today in the dispensation of grace because you will be dead and it will not work. But I do believe that the body of Christ was ramped up. Uh, from day one, and that the reason Paul baptized these guys in, in Corinth was because they were kingdom saints. And that answers all those questions. Not because he didn't understand, but he knew kingdom saints needed that. Now we get to Romans chapter 16. Paul says, Now to him that is of power to establish you, and that's the completed form of being established. <laughs> you're, you're totally complete, okay? According to my gospel. Now, when Paul says my gospel, he's talking about the dispensation of the grace of God. He was the leader of that movement. So he says, if you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, which is Paul's gospel, you're now established in the body of Christ. You're placed into the body of Christ. And the preaching of Jesus Christ, what? According to the revelation of the mystery. That's the part that nobody knew about ahead of time. I've said before, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not the mystery. Okay, What happened because of Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection is the mystery. And a lot of that is on the spiritual side and has to do with the downfall of Satan and Satan losing all of his power and, and God taking the heavenly realm back as far as that goes. But then Paul says, which was kept secret, how long? Since the world began. So the, the mystery part is something that wasn't talked about until Paul came on the scene. But just so you know, it's not a mystery anymore. We do not belong to a secret society that has a secret handshake. We're allowed to talk about it. In Romans 16, 26, it says, But now is made manifest. Okay. Next verse says, hey, Okay, it's, it's now revealed. And by the scripture of the prophets, according to the commandment of everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So Paul is the head of a dispensation of grace. He's the head of the body of Christ. And he's the one that tells us about this mystery. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all expectation, that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now I want you to remember this comment where Paul says he's the chief. What he's saying there is he's the 
worst of the worst of sinners. Okay? He, he says, I am not a good person. Now, we're going to see a comment a little bit later this morning where Paul says that according to the law, he was blameless. So how do you go from being blameless to being the chief of sinners? And what Paul was doing, what he's talking about here, is when he would go out and gather those who followed Christ as the Messiah and have them either thrown in prison or killed. To him, that was a, he finally figured out that, yeah, I shouldn't have been doing that. <laughs> but at the time he was doing it, he thought he was God's best friend, that he was going to probably get extra rewards for doing that. So he, that was a change of Paul's attitude. But he says, you know, Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. And that's so true. And he says, of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause? What's the cause? Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. For this cause, I obtain mercy. Now, what, what should have God done to Paul rather than save him? Kill him. And Paul knew that. Even under the law, Paul was, he was guilty of killing innocent people. He should have been killed himself. That Paul says what? That in me first. All right, so th this is what this, this gentleman was starting to ask me. So if, if Paul was first, and first at what? The first person saved into the dispensation of the grace of God. And what his question was, all right, so if you say it didn't happen on the road to Damascus, show me through Scripture when it did happen. All right? Because we do know that Paul is the first person. So when was the first person saved? Now, the problem I have with some pastors is they, they, they anticipate revelation. Okay? And because they anticipate revelation, they make things happen before they happen. Because they know they're going to happen. Now, that's like either being Calvinistic or Arminian. Okay? <laughs> what Cal Calvinism teaches is that God picked those who were going to be saved. And then he died for those. And the ones he didn't pick, he didn't die for. Because if Christ would have died for somebody who wasn't saved, what would have happened? Well, they would have been saved. So we can't have them dying for people that are, are saved because ultimately everybody that Christ died for is saved because we can't have Christ wasting any of his blood. Now, okay, and that's not scriptural. It just sounds good. Okay, So <laughs> that's what they say. Now, the Arminians, they're, they're a little bit better, but they're still wrong. They say that free will is involved. So God looked ahead in time forward, saw who was going to believe, and then he picked those to be saved because he knew they were going to believe. But the ones that didn't, weren't going to believe on their own, he never died for those. Because again, if Christ dies for somebody who's not saved, well, they would be saved. <laughs> Folks, the, the blood of Jesus Christ is not what saves you. It's what makes you savable. Because, <laughs> again, there's two parts to reconciliation. Remember that? Yep. One part God did. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and rose again. That made everyone savable. Amen. Now we have to do our part. And believe. believe. <laughs> That's when we are reconciled to God. And then we have, as Pastor Baker always said, then we have conciliation or we have total reconciliation, whatever word you want to use. So, if Christ died for somebody who didn't believe, is that a waste of Christ's blood? No. no. It just means they're savable. Okay? And that's it. That's kind of like, and I, I would love to do this time. I would love to write everybody a check for a million dollars and say, here you guys go, you're all millionaires, but just don't take it to the bank. Why? Uh, 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 eh, I'm going to jail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just tried to cash a bad check. Okay? Um, now, so it, when Christ died on the cross, in a sense, he, he gave you a check for eternal life. Here you go. Your sins are now paid for. Either cash it or just kind of do it on your own. And most people say, I'll do it on my own. You know, let's leave your check sit here. And they never cash the check. And I don't know if that's a good illustration or not, but that's kind of what happened. Is, you know, it's, it's not a waste of blood. Christ did pay for their sins, but they chose to do it their way which is to work their way to heaven. And even then, even then, when the lost get to, you know, the eternal lake of fire or their final judgment, which is the great white throne judgment, they're going to be judged according to their, what word does King James use? Works. works. Is that different than sins? Yes, it is. I think it is. And someone said, well, those are works of sin. I, I, I know that. <laughs> but they're still works. So they're going to stand before God and they're going to tell God about all the good works they did. They're not going to bring up the bad stuff. They're not that stupid. 
They're going to bring up all the good works. And I'll guarantee you, some of these people, the amount of good works that they're going to present to God would make us look bad. Okay? But because they're done in the flesh, they're not good enough. Okay? Our works, you know, look, not to quote Danny for the thousandth time, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is followed by Ephesians what? 10. We are as a workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. That, that's the purpose. You don't put the cart in front of the horse. You put the cart behind the horse. Works are desired after salvation, but not to get us saved. So that, that's what's going on here, okay? How be it for this cause, I obtain mercy that in me first, that's Paul, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So we know Paul was the first person put into the body of Christ. And the reason I can't let him be put into the body of Christ on the road to Damascus is I have nothing there that shows that he was saved into the body of Christ. I know he was saved by believing that Christ is the Messiah, but does believing that Christ is the Messiah save you into the body of Christ? No. Well, well Paul eventually is going to know that, so God just gave him credit ahead of time. You know, ever have a teacher do that? I know you're going to turn your work in, so I'm going to give you an A now. Okay. In that case, why do the work, right? You know. So we do. I do know Paul believed that. And here's the problem people have. You can't have people jumping around from one dispensation to another. You can't have Paul in the kingdom program here, and then all of a sudden the next verse, he's over in the body of Christ. I'm going to show you a verse where God says that Paul was moved. He's the only one that was moved. He's the only one. But he, I believe, was a kingdom saint that started out and then was moved into the body of Christ. All right, we're not going to go through Acts 13 again. I think I uh, went through that last week and probably bored you to death with it. But the first time Paul says anything remotely that sounds like grace is not until Acts 13. He doesn't say anything in Acts 9 that sounds gracey. He says a lot of really cool kingdom things, but he doesn't say anything that is grace where he cannot... Take it back in a sense, you know, where he, he says it and he, he's got to now deal with it. But in, in Acts 13, Paul says, But he, whom God raised again, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And even up until then, I, that's still kind of a kingdom thing, okay? Now, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. These are fighting words, <laughs> okay? This is not good kingdom doctrine, okay? Even though, in the sense, it's true in all dispensations, Paul is saying the law never saved anyone. Well, that's true, but the law was a vehicle that God used to get people saved. This is a change. Now, if anybody looks, see on top there, is that a 9 or is that a 13? It's a 13. That's why when people push me, I say, well, the first time we see Paul preaching grace is in Acts 13. But that's not even a really good, you know, a good verse to use. I have a better verse in the beginning of Acts 13. In fact, James and I were talking about it this morning. In Acts 13 to 28, both programs are available to be added to. But after Acts 28, no, new, no one new was added to the kingdom program, but those saved before, here's important too, were kept in the kingdom program. Because some people say, all right, so you're, you're waiting until Acts 28, then anybody who was alive after Acts 28, they were put into the body of Christ. No, no, they continued on until they died with a kingdom hope, with a kingdom promise, observing the law. That's where the problem comes in. So when Paul runs into a Jew in Corinth, which he ran into a lot of them, and he gave them the kingdom gospel, and they believed the kingdom gospel, they weren't put into the body of Christ. They were put in the kingdom program. And that's why Paul went around water baptizing them, because he had to. David. I, I, in a sense, he's talking about the kingdom program, but I think paradise, he probably meant Abraham's bosom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think it was he was talking about the thousand years. I think he was talking about the, the, the kingdom in the sense of the place of waiting where all the Old Testament saints are. Yeah, you know. Jesus hadn't really died for no, no, but because this guy had faith, he believed Christ was a Messiah. And oh, okay. some people have also said, well, he wasn't water baptized. 
if for some reason he could have got off that cross, there is cross that he was on, and they would have had time, he would have had to be water baptized. God did take that into account. You know, I mean, he just didn't have time. It wasn't possible. Because I'll guarantee that thief was not, a water, was not water baptized, but he needed to be if it was possible. So that's a good question, though. Okay. But here's the problem. They have two programs going on side by side, even though the one is diminishing does create conflict because as Paul is writing these churches in the early part of Acts, they have both groups in their churches. You talk about a mess. Now, the biggest church that had the biggest mess was the Corinthian church. And a lot of these Corinthians, because they were kingdom saints, had all these sign gifts. That's why Paul answers that question. These are all going to fade away, guys. But they were active. And so they'd come together with, for these feast days, and the biggest feast day they were dealing with was um, the Passover meal. And some of them came and had a big party and got drunk, and some people came and had nothing. And the grace people came just to be nice, I think, because they can observe it too. And it was just a mess. And we see a big mess as far as that goes. But if you understand what's going on, it makes a little more sense. Acts 22. Men, brethren, fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make unto you now. And Paul here is he's defending himself, and he's going back and talking about what happened on the road to Damascus. Because I want to know what God told him. I was talking to James a couple weeks ago, and, and we know what God told Ananias in Acts 9. But that's not what he told Paul. That's what he told Ananias. <laughs> so you remember that. Just because God's telling Ananias something. What did Paul know, and when did he know it? And that's important. I don't think during those three days that Paul was blinded that God told him really anything. And so Paul is trying to put the pieces together. Now, if you understand Paul's background, Paul was not an idiot in regards to the law. What was Paul? He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew the Old Testament law better than you and I will ever know the Old Testament law. So now that he realizes the one thing he didn't have right is Jesus Christ, that Christ was the Messiah, Christ was the King, he is the Son of God, I think all the pieces started to come together really well. Uh, but there was no grace program there. James? One thing that he, he knew the truth, he didn't die. I, I think in Paul's mind, you're right, James. I think he was like, why didn't God just kill me? And I, if I would have been a, a fellow believer at that time, I would have been like, he needs to die. <laughs> yeah. The reason I say that is because what he says, uh, part of that other passage you, you quoted in Acts 1.15, okay. he says, who was before a blasphemer? Yeah, yeah. Stole blasphemer. Yeah. Yeah, a blasphemer would be somebody who said something that wasn't true. But guess what? Right. Paul, Paul felt that Christ was not the Messiah. He wasn't the Son of God. He might have been a rabbi, but uh, anybody who followed him was following a false god because Christ claimed to be God. And that was like, oh, no, that's not going to work. Um, so, yeah, and that, that's why Paul had a lot to think about on the road to Damascus. And God never took away his appetite. But he didn't eat anything for three days either, okay? He took away his sight. Well, why was it? It shows how devastated he was, and he didn't feel like eating. And when you're really upset about something, usually you're not, let's go out to eat. You know, usually that's not what happens. All right, so Paul is defending himself here in the end of Acts. He says, I verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamelia. Again, this would have been an Old Testament law teacher, okay, fellow rabbi probably, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. So again, Paul probably, the equivalent, he probably had a Ph.D. in prophecy, okay, or Old Testament law. I mean, the guy was a, uh, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was probably part of the Sanhedrin, which is like the upper council of the Pharisees. Um, perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God, and ye all are this, as ye are all this day. So, he definitely thought he was doing God's will when he was capturing these people who follow Christ as the Messiah. He really thought God was going to be happy with them. And I persuaded this way unto, the, and I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. That's the chief of sinners part. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, in Philippians chapter three, verse one, Paul says, "Finally, my brethren." Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of a concession. concession. He's talking about those people he used to work for, but I do think he also is talking about 
anybody who observed the law. Okay? For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. So Paul's now going to go through, I think, the things that he used to look at to prove how amazing he was. His pedigree. His pedigree. That's a good word. Um, in other words, if, if he were to put his resume in, this is what it would have said. <laughs> okay. Um, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Okay. The tribe of Benjamin. Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law of Pharisee. Again, he, he was at the top. Okay. He was one of the religious leaders of Israel. Concerning zeal. So not only did he have the, the knowledge, he also had the drive, okay? Persecuting the church. Then he says, touching the righteousness which is in the law. Wait, wait a second. What righteousness is there in the law? <laughs> the law was given to show unrighteousness, right? So why, why was Paul saying, touching the righteousness which is in the law? Then he says, blameless. What had the Jews done with the law after Moses gave it to them. They what? There you go. They massaged it, and they made it work. So Paul thought that he was doing everything right. I think he was probably the most arrogant person you ever would run into. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He knew, right, he knew how to play the game. Yeah. Bring your right sacrifices, observe the feast days, do everything right, have all the right words. And so he's like, I, I'm, I'm blameless. I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. Except one thing. Except one thing, which is what? If the law had not said, come to this, I had not known sin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Had said, he, he, had, he had a lot of pride. <laughs> yeah. but, but the point is, this, you're seeing what's going on in his mind. He's like, I'm blameless. I'm doing everything right. I, I am like the best of the best. He, he really thought that he was doing things right. And that... God should have been giving them an award, not striking them down dead. Okay. All right, back to Acts 9. Let's see what actually happened. All right. Verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. Now, we're going to get to a little bit of an issue here because when you read the beginning of Acts and the book of Acts, it sounds like this all happened the same day. And as I said before, there's a three-year gap here <laughs> of where Paul disappears from Damascus goes to the desert for three years and then comes back to Damascus. But either way, whether it's three years or not, when I read this, I can't find death, burial, and resurrection here. I'm like, well, Dave, he, he knew it. Well, why didn't he say it? Okay. Now, straightway he preached, where did he go? He went into the synagogue. I said before, as a whole, who's hanging out in the synagogue? Jews. Are they Little flock Jews. No, no. They're, they're ones who believed like Paul used to believe, that Christ was a fake, he was an imposter, he needed to die. They were still waiting for their Messiah. So he went in and talked to unsaved, unbaptized, unregenerated Jews who needed to know who Christ was. Okay, People who used to believe like him. Okay, And he tells them that he, which is Christ, is the Son of God. Now, that's what he was doing when he came to Damascus to begin with, was finding those people and taking them back, as far as those who believe that, back to Jerusalem. And all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them, which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for this, that intent, that he might bring them bound into the chief priests? And the answer is, yeah. So Paul had become one of them. <laughs> okay, He kind of switched sides. The people he was going after, he now is one of them. Now, that doesn't go over well with the leadership in Damascus because they, they don't like those people who called Christ the Messiah. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now, and I don't know why they don't put the word the on there. But again, proving that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, proving that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, proving that Jesus Christ was the Savior, okay? He, he really isn't talking about death, burial, and resurrection. I don't think he is, because that's not the kingdom gospel. Now, is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ necessary in every dispensation? You betcha it is. If Christ wouldn't have died, even Adam would not be sent. And that's one of those things where, where God knew it was going to happen, and he kind of took care of it. 
but we can't do that for Paul. Paul here is not teaching a grace message, even if he may have known the grace message. We're going to get that in a second, okay? And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to what? Kill him. Welcome to Paul's life. Now, who was trying to kill him? The 12 disciples? The little flock? No, 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 no. The people Paul used to work for, <laughs> okay? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the ones who gave him orders to go to Damascus to gather these people, they now added him to their list. In fact, he was probably number one on their list. But their lying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. The disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And Saul was come to Jerusalem. He essayed or tried to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed that he was, and believed not that he was a disciple. I look at that and you go, this would make a good movie. <laughs> hey, I'm one of you, because I'm going to infiltrate your, you know, he's like a double agent. I'm going to infiltrate you guys, figure out where you're hiding out, and I'm going to go tell my buddies where you're at, and they're going to come and get you. I'd be just as afraid, wouldn't you? The, the leader of the movement that was trying to kill you now says, I'm on your side. <laughs> yeah, okay. They didn't believe him. Didn't believe him at all. But Barnabas, okay, took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. All of us need a Barnabas in our life. You know that? Somebody who comes along and says, this guy's for real. I've been with him. I know about him. I worked with him. He's for real. And so Barnabas really becomes Paul's savior in a sense and tells the 12, hey, this guy's cool. Mentor. Don't be afraid. Mentor? I don't know about mentor as much as just gave him credibility more than anything else. Yeah, vouch for him. him. And do we find Barnabas anywhere else in Paul's life? Yeah, he's his first companion. Now, was Barnabas a grace believer? No. He came out of the kingdom church. That's not up for debate. He sold his property. He's a kingdom saint from one end to the other. So Paul, Paul's first you know, co-worker, is, in a sense, is a kingdom saint. And he was in with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians that they went about to slay him. These are not Gentiles. These are Greek-speaking Gentiles. Jews. Remember that. The Jews, again, who didn't believe, wanted him dead. And, and again, um, yeah, we'll go there. And when they, the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. As long as Paul was in Jerusalem, it was going to be a problem. Because his old bosses wanted him dead. And I, I think the 12 knew that. Like, hey, Paul, you are the hottest potato. I mean, you're around here. Everybody's trying to kill you, and they're going to kill us too. Maybe you should go back to Tarsus for a while. Do you know how long Paul stayed in Tarsus until uh, Acts 13? Ten years. For ten years, Paul was off the scene. And here's the question. Well, what was he doing? <laughs> What did Paul do for 10 years between Acts 9 and Acts 13? Or actually Acts 12 back in there when he finally shows up. Um, we get to Acts 13, 1. All right? And Paul's been one year in Antioch, it says. And there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas. Okay, there, remember that guy we talked about earlier? A kingdom saint, okay? This is a kingdom church, okay? And Lucas and uh, Simeon and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetric and Saul. All right. They ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, Separate me. Now, when someone tells you to separate, it, it means that you were together. Okay, It means you, you need to move apart. Why does the Holy Spirit want Paul and Barnabas to separate, to get away from this church in Antioch? Well, he says why. For the work wherein I have called them. Well, I thought this was a grace church all along. So why would the Holy Spirit want Paul to separate from a grace church to, to start a grace church? No. This was a kingdom church. If you want to know when the body of Christ started, as far as Paul started preaching it, it's Acts 13. But I do believe that Paul was probably saved into the body of Christ in Acts 9, but not on the road to Damascus. Okay, But at this point, Paul starts 
teaching it. It's kind of like there are certain laws. If you ever listen to the television, it'll get to be at the beginning of a year. Say, all right, now we have new laws that have what? Gone into effect today. Well, when were, when were they voted on? Months and months before. But now they finally go into effect. Even if Paul was a member of the body of Christ before this, he wasn't taking it on the road in a sense or teaching it yet until now because it says separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work where I've called them. So before that they weren't doing it. So if you push me I say Acts 13.1 we see the start of the body of Christ to where it was now available to the common man. Does that make any sense? That's what I see going on there. To the Gentiles or to anyone. But Paul already was part of the body of Christ at this time. But it wasn't available to anybody else. He was the first person that was moved in. But now he's going to start taking it to other people. He fasted and prayed and laid hands on them. They sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed. And they went around. Okay. And when they're, well, and they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they had also John to the ministry. First thing Paul does is he goes into the synagogue when he separates himself to the ministry he's supposed to do. Okay, Acts 13.45 says, And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. These Jews saw the multitude. These were unsaved Jews. Okay, this, weren't the little, this was not the little flock. This wasn't the twelve. This wasn't kingdom saints. These were lost Jews that Paul had met in the synagogue, which every time Paul went to the synagogue, how did it end? <laughs> some, some, some believed, some didn't, and the ones that didn't wanted to do what to Paul? Paul. Kill him. <laughs> and so Paul would go, all right, I'm out of here. And then he took those who believed, and he started a church with them. Now, were those people saved into the body of Christ? I don't think they were. I think they were still kingdom saints, and we see that over and over and over again, okay? Then Paul and Barnabas wax bold. This is why we're here, because we have this, remember we have this diminishing, which is the kingdom program fading, yet people are still being saved. Paul and Barnabas wax bold and said, now who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Jews that want to kill him, okay? It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Who's the you? I think the you is the Jews, okay? And judge, and seeing you, I'm sorry, spoken of you, but seeing ye put it from you, which means you don't want it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the, the Gentiles. Now, that's good grace doctrine, okay? But who did Paul go to first? The Jews. Again, you never want to pull your doctrine out of Acts unless you're a kingdom saint. <laughs> Don't pull grace doctrine. The book of Acts is written to show what? Why Israel was set aside. Why was Israel set aside? Unbelief. And, and over and over again, in fact, Paul basically says these words three times. And the third time he says, and they will believe it. And it's like strike one, strike two, strike three. It's like, Jews, I'm going to tell you why you're being set aside. And so up until Acts 28, it's still available, it's diminishing, but it's kind of like God's giving him one more chance to just kind of get it. And they don't get it, and so finally in Acts 28, it's like, all right, everybody out of the pool, you're totally set aside, and you're going to wait until the body of Christ is raptured home. After Acts 28, there was only one program available to be saved in. Even if you were a Jew and you believed Christ was the Messiah, if you hadn't believed that earlier, you had to believe he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again. And then you were put into the body of Christ. You run into a Jew today, you better give him the grace message. Okay? The kingdom message is not available. Now, once the body of Christ gets raptured out, I'll guarantee you grace will be very popular. <laughs> but that's when the kingdom program comes back into effect again. Okay? So Paul says, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, returning to the Gentiles. And so he says that three different times in the book of Acts. And... Every time it's like strike one, strike two. It's almost 30 years between 13 and 20 years. 30 years, yeah. 30 years. Interesting, yeah. That's a long time. It's not as yeah. close as Yeah, right. And that's even like an act sign. It looks like all this happened in a row. It's three years later. But what Danny said, for those of you who didn't hear, it's 30 years from, is it Acts 13 to Acts 28? It's 30 years. That's a long time. 
Yeah, it's a long time. It, it is a long time. Um, and, and so it is interesting. Um, the Gentiles heard this. They were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of God was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Again, we've seen before. Um, Paul, first he has to leave, um, and then eventually they try to kill him. Okay? Paul always was hunted down by the Jews uh, that didn't believe, and they wanted him dead. Okay? They shook the dust off their feet against them and came to Iconium. And then finally they went to Lystra, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Now, Acts 26. Now we're getting towards the end of, of Acts, okay? And verily, though, thought to myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And Paul is defending himself. Which things I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and, and when they were, were put... And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Again, the same thing that Paul explained earlier. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now, Paul was a crazy man. I and mean, he was following these guys wherever they went. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, and at midday, O king, talking to King Agrippa, I saw on the way a light from heaven, about the, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Again, this is the same thing that happened in Acts 9, because Paul is just repeating what happened. But we get a little more information here. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. I think at this point is when, like we said earlier, Paul was like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I think reality is like, oh, that's not good. I think I'm dead. <laughs> okay. But this is what he said. This is what Christ said. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of the things which thou hast seen and of those things which I will appear unto thee. Now, I think he's saying kingdom and now grace. He's saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you more. But he doesn't tell them then. He just kind of says, hey, things you know and things you don't know. And so Paul has a choice here, he either believes or not. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. I think, oh, see, that's grace. Well, as I said a few weeks ago, was it ever wrong for a Jew to go to a Gentile? From God's perspective, it was no. But the Jews had turned it into, don't go to the Gentiles, they're bad people. But the Jews always were supposed to go to the Gentiles. Going into all the world, that would include Gentiles, okay? To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness for sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now again, you can read grace into that. But I... Like, you got to wait until it's actually said. Whereupon, O Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. Now, this is interesting. Repent. Does that mean stop sinning? No. Change their way of thinking. Think who Christ is as the Messiah. Turn to God. And now here. Do works. Meet for repentance. But is that a grace doctrine? No. No. If I ever got stood up here and said, you guys got to start doing more works that show your repentance or you're not saved, I shouldn't do that, though. <laughs> That's the law. I, I don't, this is not good grace doctrine. Now, nothing wrong with it. I, I w wish people did more works meet for repentance, but that's not the point. He's putting this, I think he's telling them the kingdom message. There's nothing wrong with Paul teaching the kingdom message up until God told him to start teaching grace. And these were, I, I think these were basically Jews he was talking to anyways. Um, for, these, for these causes, the Jews caught me. <laughs> Again, where was he? In the temple, of course, and were about to kill me. Okay, and that goes back to what happened and why he was before King Agrippa to begin with. All right, now we're going to get to 
the Galatians account, and, and I'm, I'm working on another sermon, which I don't know if I'm going to get it done in the next couple weeks or not. We look at the Jerusalem Council from an Acts perspective versus a Galatians perspective, or from a kingdom perspective versus a, a grace perspective, and it's almost like it's two different accounts. And that's because it's from a grace perspective and a kingdom perspective. It is kind of interesting. Paul is talking to the Galatians, and he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now he's writing grace believers. He says, you guys are you're going back into another gospel. But then, verse 7 is interesting, which is not another. And I always looked at that for years and go, well, wait, Paul, make up your mind. <laughs> Either it's different or it's not. Well, what's he talking about? Is the kingdom gospel and the grace gospel different? Yes. yes. But it's about the same what? Jesus. Same Lord. same Lord. That's why Paul says it's not another. Because in their mind, like, we're just going back to the original one. We're going back to the kingdom gospel. Paul's like, no, okay. They're, they're removed from the grace message, and they're going to back to the kingdom gospel. Because they're saying it's not another gospel. And Paul's like, yes, it is. But there be some that trouble you, which would pervert the gospel of Christ. How do you pervert the gospel of Christ? You start adding things to it. And again, that's probably the number one problem that believers have today. And I've heard some really, really good salvation messages come out of somebody who's not grace. And after the saved, they go, well, James, now that you're a believer, we have to get you water baptized. <laughs> Three times. Well, maybe you should do four. <laughs> Janet, how many times have you been in? Four. Oh, right, Janet's ahead of you. So, anybody can beat four baptisms? <laughs> you, are you counting your spiritual baptism? Well, then you get five, right? Yeah. <laughs> Only one that counts. <laughs> and that's what a lot of. And that's when you take grace and you make it law light. Well, we're going to add a few things to it. Like, you know, you have to start tithing and you have to start getting water baptized and you have to dedicate your life to Christ. I always love that one, which means stop sinning. <laughs> and you have to do God's will, which means you probably got to be a missionary to some unknown country that you really don't want to do, but you got to do God's will. And that they, they pervert it. That's what they're doing. And you think you have problems with that today in America? Paul had problems with that. Galatians chapter 1. <laughs> it's been going on. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Wow, those are fighting words. <laughs> As we said before, and so we now and now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be accursed. Do you think Paul is a little bit adamant about this? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But do you think Paul was a little bit frustrated that people had taken the grace message and perverted it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Does that frustrate because he was trying to kill him. Well, they were trying to kill him. But doesn't that frustrate you when you see somebody who's in a sense saved? I, I see that with kids from camp. We get them saved. They understand salvation is faith plus nothing. And they go back to denominational churches and the first thing they do is they put them back under the law. <laughs> Guess what? They're already saved. Ha. You know. And so they mess them all up. And that, that's the problem. And that's what Paul's saying there. Don't, you know, pervert it. But I'm trying to make it better, Pastor. If we don't give these people rules, next thing you know, they're going to be hunting and fishing all the time. Right, Danny? So we need a few rules. We need to scare them. If you fish on Sunday morning, you're not even going to catch anything, Danny. So don't even bother. <laughs> you know? And so we start. Is that true, though? <laughs> Danny would know. He never tried fishing on Sunday mornings. <laughs> For do I now persuade men or God? Or do you seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Now what does that mean? He didn't learn it from Peter, James, and John. Or Camellia, yeah, you're right. Or his old teacher from college days, wherever it be. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the answer is, when, when did Christ tell him this stuff? After he had <laughs> ascended back there. Yeah, but it, it had to be between Acts 9 and Acts 13 somewhere. And so we have, to, that's why people say, well, when exactly was Paul put in the body of Christ? I think when he understood the grace message. I do, okay? 
For you have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jewish religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jewish religion above mine equals and mine own nation being more exceedingly zealous of traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. This, this is very interesting. We're going to see it in 1 Corinthians. Well, we're going to have time for that today. Paul says he was born out of due time. Let me actually get to that just so we can get to that today. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul starts out and he gives the gospel. In fact, in the back of my business card is 1 Corinthians 15, um, <clears throat> verses 2 and 3. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which is the grace gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So Paul's saying, this is what you have to believe. It's not that difficult. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Again, this is Paul's Gospel. Verse 4, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, Paul's going to go through a whole discourse of saying, guess what? A lot of people know he resurrected the dead because a whole bunch of them saw him, okay? But verse 7 says, and after that he was seen of James and then of the other apostles. And then he says, and last of all, now, when, when did Paul and Christ run into each other? James, you said earlier, I think. After yeah, after he was risen. Paul saw him on the road to Damascus. Okay? He, it seemed to me also one born out of due time. Okay? The word here is aborted from my appointed course. And I, I think there's a lot here in verse 8 that talks about Paul had an appointed course. What was Paul's original appointed course? He was a kingdom saint. And if, if grace never, never came along, and I know this is a terrible argument because God knew it was going to come along, but let's say grace never came along. Could Paul have continued in the kingdom message if he never received grace? And the answer is, yeah, he could have. Okay? But God aborted him out of that appointed course. Okay? His appointed course was kingdom, and God said, nope. You're going to start the grace movement. And he took him out. He's the only one that I believe was taken out of that. And, and we're going to actually stop there. Because God had to start the grace program. But you cannot anticipate revelation. So, to answer the question this guy asked, Paul was probably saved when he went to Arabia for three years. God taught him grace. And then he came back to Damascus and he taught kingdom. Because God said, we're not going to talk about this yet until I tell you it's time to talk about it, which was in Acts 13. So, Paul was saved in Acts 9. For all you Acts 9ers, you're like, yes! But the body of Christ didn't start till Acts 13. Yes! <laughs> and, and, yes, go ahead, James. Here's what Christ told Ananias. What Christ told Ananias. Okay. He is a chosen vessel unto me. When did Paul become a chosen vessel unto Christ? Now, that's the question. When did Paul become a chosen vessel unto Christ? Right. I would say as soon as God said it. Before the foundation of the world. Okay. Well, I guess we all could fall into that category too, that before the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we again thank you. We can understand Acts and we can see what's going on. And I know at times it gets almost frustrating. Um, and I know some are thinking I should get over it. I, I just see it, Lord, as an understanding of Acts, and I thank you that we can understand Acts, and we can see these two programs going on, and we can actually make sense of this, as Paul worked with the Jews and worked with the Gentiles up until Acts 28, just trying to get the Jews to see where they were wrong, yet being hunted down every step of the way. We thank you, Lord, for Paul's patience, and we, Lord, we thank you for your patience as you are patient with us. And again, we thank you for your death your burial, and your resurrection. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks, for your time. Pastor.